Well, good, good, good morning, good, good day from me. Uh, I am uh, Daniel Smilov. Uh, I am uh, uh, associate professor at the University of Sofia. And uh, I also work for a Bulgarian think tank, which is called uh, Center for Liberal Strategies. Uh, it's uh, my uh, great pleasure to chair this panel. Uh, and uh, uh, for that, I want to thank uh, the organizers of uh, the conference. And uh, so uh, again, I'll say that it's my great privilege to, to chair this uh, panel uh, on which uh, we have uh, two excellent uh, scholars, uh, very established, distinguished uh, scholars. Uh, I'll start with Professor Renata Uitz. Uh, she is from the Central European University. Uh, she's uh, uh, Hungarian and uh, she's going to speak uh, about uh, <clears throat> illiberal democracy. Uh, Renata Uitz is very well placed to talk on this topic uh, because, uh, of course, she has numerous publications, but very recently. Uh, she published as a co-editor and author uh, a, a very authoritative uh, handbook, uh, Routledge handbook on illiberal democracy. So I really look forward to, to uh, her presentation. But first we are going to have uh, uh, my friend and co colleague Adam Bodnar, uh, who uh, probably doesn't uh, need to be uh, introduced apart from being uh, 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 very uh, prominent uh, legal scholar and dean of a law school in uh, uh, Warsaw. Uh, he, he, uh, he has been also a Polish ombudsman. He spent uh, uh, six years uh, as a Polish ombudsman and his um, mandate uh, expired uh, this year, but uh, he made a very uh, important contribution to uh, Polish law and Polish public uh, life. Uh, so uh, uh, Adam Bodnar is going to speak on the role of uh, uh, the, the Court of the European Union and the ECHR as uh, guardians of uh, the rule of law uh, in Poland, uh, a, a topic uh, which is uh, of uh, huge interest uh, at the moment uh, for various reasons. So, uh, reason. so without further ado, I want to, to give the floor to, to Adam and I really look forward to his uh, presentation. Thank you uh, very much uh, uh, again for, for the organization of the whole uh, event. So please, Adam, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, important uh, conference. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Olga Sidorowicz for making it uh, happen. Uh, I must start by saying, and thank you, Daniel, for this extremely nice uh, uh, introduction. I must start by saying that I'm right now in Lisbon on the Rule of Law Conference. Uh, and interestingly, uh, I was just, uh, I had to leave the, the conference room and could not hear to a speech of our common friend, Professor Andras Shayo, because he's just, uh, just speaking at uh, at another place in, in Lisbon just to be with, uh, with you. And it's quite interesting that most probably we'll talk about more or less the same uh, issues. Uh, so let me start by saying that uh, uh, the role of the European Union Court, uh, Court of Justice, and the European Court of Human Rights was extremely important with respect to changes that happened in Poland. Uh, I think those changes are pretty well known to everybody that starting from 2015, the process of dismantling democratic system started in Poland uh, and that uh, Polish ruling majority has implemented number of changes affecting the independence of the Polish Constitutional Court, Prosecutor's Office, public media, secret services, but also Polish uh, courts. And uh, basically Polish civil society was looking for all different kinds of responses to those challenges. So first, these were demonstrations, protests, involvement of all different international organizations. But at certain point, uh, the Polish civil society and judicial association started to use the strategic litigation. So simply litigation of some cases uh, before the uh, both Luxembourg court uh, and the court of justice of the European Union. 
I would say that the litigation before the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is the top judicial institution for the whole European Union, was not so obvious from the very beginning because uh, the Court of Justice did not have for years a clear jurisdiction concerning violation of the rule of law standards. Just to remind you, when there were some significant changes affecting presidents of courts in Hungary, uh, uh, and I mean reforms implemented by Viktor Orban around 2012-2013, that kind of cases have been uh, referred to as the cases concerning discrimination due to age and not rule of law uh, cases. So uh, I would say that one of the most important developments in the de uh, when regards uh, of, to the Court of Justice uh, of the European Union was the judgment issued in February 2018 when the Court of Justice stated that the issue of judicial independence should be subject of verification under Article 19 of the uh, Treaty on European Union. So basically that the so-called principle of effective legal protection, which should be uh, implemented and guaranteed by both the Court of Justice of the EU and the national courts, should presuppose that those courts are uh, 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 that those courts uh, uh, are uh, uh, presupposed uh, to uh, fulfill a judicial independence um, uh, standards. Uh, and in this respect, uh, and in this respect, I think uh, uh, we should uh, remember uh, about uh, uh, this important judgment. Because this judgment uh, concerning the Association of Portuguese Judges, in fact, opened the window for uh, a, an adjudication of some uh, new uh, new cases. Uh, so, uh, what I mean by this uh, is uh, that uh, those cases uh, opened the possibility uh, for giving some new uh, judgments, new uh, jurisprudence in. Uh, cases uh, involving uh, uh, rule of law. So as a follow-up to this, the Court of Justice started to react to uh, Polish cases. Uh, and the most important, the first case uh, concerning this was the case uh, involving, um, uh, was the case involving um, uh, compulsory retirement age for Polish Supreme Court judges. At that time, uh, the Court of Justice uh, provided uh, that uh, sending 20 judges for ill retirement because of changing the retirement age from 70 to 65 is contrary to the rule of law uh, standards. Uh, and this judgment was important uh, because thanks to this judgment, and in fact, it was the only judgment implemented by Polish authorities, 20 judges of the Supreme Court could come back to adjudication. And later on, uh, in numerous other judgments, the Court of Justice referred to all different uh, reforms of the Polish judiciary, such as uh, the appointment of the new National Council of Judiciary in an unconstitutional way, or creation of the disciplinary chamber, or, an, uh, or cases that uh, uh, disabled uh, Polish judges to appeal against some undue nominations by the National Council of uh, Judiciary. But the most important case was decided on 15th July 2021, uh, so this year, just a couple of months ago, because in this case, the Court of Justice stated that the whole system of disciplinary responsibility of judges, including the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court, uh, is uh, simply contrary to uh, human rights um, uh, standards. Uh, so, uh, so basically this judgment, uh, provided for, uh, uh, provided for uh, uh, abolition uh, of the whole system of, uh, 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 abolition of the whole system of the disciplinary responsibility. So at the end of the day, uh, I think that we have right now more than 10 cases decided by the Court of Justice as a result of different procedures implemented. On the one hand, so-called infringement procedure started by the European Commission, and on the other hand, as a result of the preliminary questions made by Polish, court, Polish courts. And in all those cases, the Court of Justice uh, provided that, uh, mm, provided that uh, standards are contrary to uh, uh, human rights. Uh, it, it provided that uh, 
um, Polish reforms are contrary to the rule of law and from Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. There is like one more additional jurisdictional aspect of this, which is the procedure of so-called European arrest warrant. Under this procedure, uh, it is easier for between member states to cooperate with each other and to surrender people who are caught uh, and, they are, uh, and they are subject of some search by, by prosecution uh, authority. So simply if somebody has committed a crime in Poland and is escaping, let's say to France, it is easy to catch this person in France and then turn uh, to surrender this person back to uh, Poland. But what happened is that some uh, courts in some member states, including Ireland, Netherlands, Germany, uh, started to ask a question, okay, should we really surrender people to Poland when there is no guarantee of a trial in Poland? And the court said that in general, you must have a two-tier test, two-level test to make it. First, you should establish whether there is a general threat of the rule of law in Poland, but then second, you must establish whether in a very specific concrete case, there is a danger uh, affecting the uh, judicial independence of a given uh, of a given person, and uh, and basically it was uh, impossible to uh, establish uh, that kind of um, uh, existence of that kind of a, a test, uh, and uh, so uh, until today, uh, in fact, this cooperation uh, on the basis of the European arrest warrant still uh, operates, but still, but it is much more um, difficult. But what is, I think, extremely important is that those cases uh, are regarded by Polish authorities, by the Polish ruling majority, as a intervention, as a undue interference into Polish sovereign matters. In that the Polish bodies, Polish authorities claimed that it is the, uh, the court of justice in that kind of cases is acting ultra virus, uh, and it does not have a power to intervene. And despite the pressure, the political pressure, coming from the European Commission, despite the fact that uh, EU money, a significant EU money for so-called EU recovery fund has been suspended to Poland, despite the fact that there are penalties imposed on Poland by the Court of Justice, Polish authorities do not want to implement those um, cases. And there are more and more judges who are subject of pressure, who are also suspended, because they uh, decide to, uh, uh, use the to use the EU law, EU law standards and EU jurisprudence, and not uh, the um, uh, and not let's say they do not follow the vision of the Polish government, and quite fundamentally on seventh October two thousand twenty one, uh, the Polish constitutional court, which is heavily and politically dominated by the uh, by the ruling majority, has made a case saying that it is the Polish constitution that should have a primacy over the EU law, and it is not the role of the Court of Justice to impose on Poland that kind of um, uh, obligations. Uh, and this case had a dramatic uh, effect uh, on the discussion concerning Polish membership in the EU, uh, because uh, some people claim that this case might be regarded as a start of so-called Pol exit, Poland exiting the European Union. I hope it will not happen. And basically I do everything what is possible in order not to not do this to, um, uh, to happen. But basically this threat is, uh, I would say much more uh, visible than any time um, uh, before, because uh, even if Poland stays in the European Union, this like like the sense of the legal membership is hollowed out, uh, and this membership is becoming quite shallow, uh, because we can imagine that in different uh, issues re requiring mutual cooperation, mutual recognition of judgments, cooperation between judicial system, it will be more and more difficult when Polish courts are becoming uh, so much. Uh, uh, politically uh, subordinated. But there is another dimension of this, because as I said, this strategic litigation resulted not only in the Court of Justice cases and this development of the whole jurisprudence under the leadership of Kuhn Linnartz, uh, the Chief Justice of the Court of Justice, who became really like a crucial person in this, in this battle, but the strategic litigation also resulted in numerous cases brought to the European Court of uh, Human Rights. Uh, and those cases brought to the European Court of Human Rights uh, were important uh, because they also produced important uh, judgments, not only concerning Poland, but also concerning other countries. And especially I would like to mention here the Astradson case, uh, 
concerning Iceland, in which the uh, in which standards concerning uh, judicial independence and the influence of the executive power on appointments have been uh, established. Uh, so when it comes to Poland, of course, the Court of Human Rights had a relatively easier task, because if you look into previous jurisprudence concerning such cases like Vaka against Hungary, Kudeshkina against Russia, a lot of cases concerning Macedonia, Romania, uh, you can find a lot of different standards concerning judicial independence, the definition of the court uh, under the convention, and so on. So the, the first important judgment was uh, decided in May this year. It was the case Xeroflor, saying that, and in this court, the ECHR stated that presence of one so-called double judge in the constitutional court, uh, so the judge who was unduly appointed, is basically constituted a problem uh, from the point of view of the European Convention, because it means that this uh, the court uh, cannot uh, adjudicate, uh, uh, cannot be regarded as a, uh, because the constitutional tribunal cannot be regarded as a court within the meaning of the convention when the composition of this court is basically wrong. Later on, there were some cases decided uh, concerning dismissal of presidents of Polish courts, it was the case Broda and Boyara, but also cases concerning the statues of uh, two new chambers uh, created in the uh, Polish Supreme Court, especially the disciplinary chamber. Uh, and in all those cases, to a great extent, the European Court of Human Rights was going into the same direction. So that all those changes affecting Polish judiciary should be qualified as being contrary to the European Convention on Human Rights. Right now, we are waiting for a very interesting judgment, Grzenda against Poland. Uh, this case is already after the hearing of the European Court of Human Rights. And this case concerns not only a status of a judge, but a judge who is at the same time member of the National Council of Judiciary. So like the major representative body for judges. Uh, so to what extent his independence transfers also into his independence as a uh, as a member of that kind of a representative body. And I think this decision, this judgment could be really interesting, not only from the point of view of Poland, but also from the point of view of development of standards. But what happened, ladies and gentlemen, is that you know we have this uh, inflow of cases and good judgments coming from Strasbourg. We are waiting for some new cases concerning also judges that are subject of uh, disciplinary procedures or procedures aimed to lift judicial immunity. Uh, a couple of good judges, uh, good my friends, uh, have been uh, suspended as judges, and one of them is suspended almost for two years, Judge Justician, another judge, Judge Tuleya, for, one, for more than one year, uh, the judge who is, I think, quite commonly known already internationally. Uh, so also we wait for their cases. But what happened in uh, uh, these days is that on 24th November, so just two weeks ago, the Polish Constitutional Court stated that Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, as it is interpreted by the European uh, Court of Human Rights in the context of judicial independence, is contrary to the Polish Constitution. So this time, uh, once again, the Polish uh, Constitutional Court, politically subordinated, is using its power uh, at the request of the Prosecutor General to undermine the credibility of the whole Strasbourg uh, system. So the question is, you know, what is ne next? Whether we'll observe that uh, basically government will make something like cherry picking and from time to time we'll decide via the constitutional court to undermine uh, uh, validity of some of the judgments of the uh, constitutional of the European Court of Human Rights. And it is not just an intellectual exercise uh, because uh, that kind of a practice has a strong effect on uh, has a strong effect on the uh, uh, cooperation between uh, between Polish uh, 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 between Polish authorities and the European Union and the Council of Europe. It also has a strong effect on the position of the Polish judges because if they decide to apply European Convention on Human Rights or the EU law directly, and they are and if they decide to ignore the Constitutional Court jurisprudence. Uh, then they are risking um, proceedings aiming to leave their judicial immunity. And basically it happens on a, on a daily basis. So the question is, you know, what is next? So what kind of uh, other uh, uh, pressure Polish authorities may do? 
and whether the, the membership of Poland in the EU and in the Council of Europe will be good enough to stop that kind of a process of changes. Please note that we are at this moment when it has already not just legal consequences, but also financial consequences due to the suspension of a significant funds coming from the EU uh, recovery plan. But at the same time, I think we should be happy that thanks to those all those Polish problems, uh, the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights could develop a really uh, wide ranging uh, jurisprudence on the rule of law. So let's hope that this jurisprudence will be helpful in shaping future uh, judicial independence standards in uh, Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, thanks really for this very lucid and thoughtful presentation. Uh, slightly depressing, but uh, well, that's uh, the reality. And uh, your views on, on the matter were <clears throat> extremely valuable. Uh, so now let me give the floor to Prof Professor Renate Uitz. Uh, she's going to speak, as I said, on the link between uh, human rights protection and the rise of uh, illiberal uh, democracy. Uh, well, Renata, please, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you very much to Aga Borisovna for, for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to, to, to speak after uh, uh, Adam, and, and I hope to add to, to what he has already said. Um, my, the premise of, of, of my presentation is that we, on, on Human Rights Day especially, it's extremely important to, to reflect on the broader context of, of the rise of illiberal democracies, not only in Europe, but also globally. Uh, we often hear people talking about democratic backsliding. Uh, I would suggest that it's by now, a decade into this process, or possibly even longer, it makes more sense to, to talk about the normalization of illiberal democracy. I would like to emphasize three prongs of, of this normalization that, that makes illiberal democracy, illiberal uses of constitutions and human rights into an everyday lived experience. We often talk about abusive constitutionalism, that is constitutional reforms that gradually consolidate illiberal rule in hybrid regimes. We also notice on a daily basis, uh, this is our lived experience, a high checking of, of human rights and fundamental rights language by, by the, these regimes. We are seamlessly getting used to the majoritarian readings on political rights and also applications of discrimination law that mean to protect the political and the moral majority and not vulnerable minorities. And it's a very important aspect of, of this illiberal normalization that we have gotten used to systemic regular attacks that put the international human rights regime in peril. I do emphasize that we move from subversion to open attacks on the personnel of international organizations, as well as the standards set by them. Uh, a major peril on the horizon is the retrogression of human rights protection normalizing into, into a daily experience. The latest illustration to, to such an open attack actually comes from, from Poland. Uh, Adam already mentioned the, the long ongoing conflict within the European Union about judicial independence and impartiality in Poland. Many of these battles are, are fought uh, by the Commission and ultimately by, by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights is also turning into a battlefield on account of a judgment which, uh, which Adam mentioned in the Xerofor case. The interesting response from, from the Polish Constitutional Tribunal in late November has been 
uh, from a smaller formation of a five member panel, which found Article 6 of the European Convention to be unconstitutional uh, in, in a certain regard. This is definitely an open facial attack on the European human rights system as a whole. I would like to emphasize that when we talk about illiberal normalization, we are talking about a global phenomenon and the human rights system in the Americas, the, the inter-American system is also facing similar challenges. You probably are aware of the long ongoing struggle between dominant political forces and defenders of constitutionalism locally about lifting presidential term limits. In a famous judgment, the Colombian Constitutional Court uh, argued very forcefully that separation of powers and constitutional considerations put an end to endless presidential term limits under the Colombian Constitution. This judgment, however, has been countered by several other constitutional courts which rely on the American Convention and argue that the rights of political participation under the Convention uh, give a human rights basis for eradicating presidential term limits altogether. The dispute within uh, the Americas has become such that the Secretary, of Gen Secretary General of the Organization of American States turned to a Venice Commission advisory opinion and more recently, the Inter-American Court also gave an advisory opinion uh, of its own. Uh, this was requested, not surprisingly, by the government of Colombia. In this advisory opinion, the Inter-American Court emphasized the interconnection between political rights, electoral rotation, and constitutional democracy. Note, however, that the Inter-American Court was not unanimous in, in this opinion. It voted five to two, which suggests that this is clearly a looming, slow rolling uh, process where the understanding of, of political rights and its interpretation seems to serve the majority uh, of the day. So the challenge ahead for the human rights regime comes, uh, can be broken down in several respects. First, we have to be aware of the nature of illiberal democracy, how the illiberal normalization happens through gradual, technical, legal, and constitutional changes, which mimic the language of constitutional democracy. An opinion from the Venice Commission on this change or that change that meticulously look at, looks at a particular rule very often does not assess the broader context in which such changes are happening. The ulterior purposes or pretexts of such changes are extremely difficult to capture by legal analysis, uh, as this was pointed out already. And the chilling effect of these rules is as important as their very text. We also see that resistance is very often put up in terms of constitutional identity when it comes to challenging supranational human rights norms. The language of constitutional identity on its face seems to be compatible with the logic of subsidiarity, which is very important in the European Convention. Uh, and it also comes with the veneer of democratic legitimacy after all illiberal Democrats are elected in regular elections, even if those are not terribly fair at times. Human rights defenders, and this is my third point, are increasingly demonized and attacked uh, in the current climate, together with their allies and the intellectual resources that assist them with defending, uh, with defending the human rights of unliked minorities. And we also see, and this is my fourth point, how illiberal governments are creating international alliances of their own in order to counter the existing infrastructure of the international human rights regime, uh, starting to work on, say, a counter convention to the Istanbul Convention, a convention that would protect traditional families and traditional values. 
Now, in Europe, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union started to develop in its jurisprudence a number of elements that keeps in mind illiberal normalization as a context of these legal changes. And I'm extremely grateful for, for Adam to have mentioned some of them. I would like to emphasize that we also see in several judgments, usually in cases involving legislation from Hungary, how the Court of Justice is pointing out ulterior purposes and bad faith pretexts behind national rules. The Court of Justice has started to recognize the chilling effect of these national rules in contexts outside the freedom of expression zone. So it certainly takes the existing chilling effect jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights a step further. We also see the Luxembourg Court talking about the risks particular national rules present for the founding values of the union and for human rights. So they are not waiting for the effect of these rules to set in. They are willing to take preventive action. And in a recent case, uh, we have seen the Court of Justice suggesting that there might be a way to address the retrogression uh, that is happening in, the, in national legislation. I will come back to it uh, after a, a bit of a detour. Because it's also important to see what is happening, uh, what is happening uh, in the court of justice in, 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 in the ECHR. And the ECHR, as was already mentioned, has been particularly innovative in, in applying Article 18 in recent years. It also started to put emphasis on instances where member states use the open discretion of the parliamentary majority to interfere in individual human rights cases. In the freedom of religion context, it happened in, in, in Hungary and more recently in Lithuania. We also see the court uh, becoming more and more impatient with formalistic legal justifications for particular measures that are applied by, by the government. And we have seen uh, how the court is becoming increasingly willing to draw on some of the founding principles that animate the jurisprudence of, uh, of on, 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 under particular convention articles to apply it across articles uh, in order to offer more robust protection. Uh, this, is, this is an extremely welcome development uh that uh that is certainly offering some hope on on human rights day now the one challenge before the european court of human rights is certainly tackling uh the retrogression that we currently uh that we currently face in the european human rights sphere um, in terms of retrogression, I'm particularly referring to those measures by member states, where member states take action or adopt legislation that they know full well violates an existing standard of protection. So the types of measures where the court has already said against another member state usually, uh, that for instance, it's a bad idea to, to incite against hatred, uh, to, to, to incite to hatred against religious or sexual minorities, uh, or, or to call civil society organizations foreign agents. Member states doing the same, know full well uh, that they are going against an existing standard of protection. Now, the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, earlier in the spring in the Maltese judges case emphasized that when a member state freely and voluntarily makes a commitment to join the European Union, it cannot amend its constitution after accession to the effect of reducing the, uh, the existing protection that its constitution provides to the union's founding values. Now, you can say that this is one case and this is a recent development. You can also say uh, that this one case 
emphasizes the obligations of the member state and not the obligations of union or European institutions. At the same time, the Maltese judges case, I think, is a very important development because it uses the prohibition of non-retrogression in a very general constitutional sense, moving the idea out of the zone of socioeconomic rights where it's most familiar to human rights defenders. Now, what can the ECHR take away from this? And this is really speaking the language of hope on Human Rights Day. On, on the one hand, and this is very, very minimum, very, very minimal, indirectly, the ECHR should address the lack of respect for its existing case law and the standards set by the court by particular member states. As a second step, the ECHR in certain areas may actually consider finding that there is a positive obligation to on the member states to refrain from rolling back existing protection. It wouldn't take too much, for instance, to say that there is a positive obligation to refrain from inciting animosity or hatred against religious or sexual minorities. And of course, there is an opportunity to directly address retrogression. That would take looking at the founding instruments of the Council of Europe uh, and recalling that the preamble, for instance, uh, includes a forward-looking obligation to maintain and further the realization of human rights. In addition, uh, this obligation that is expressed in the preamble can be today backed up with numerous references to the founding principles uh, of the European constitutional order, which the court has been emphasizing across cases for a long time. Uh, in a case, for instance, Janoka, more than a decade ago, the court said the convention was in fact designed to maintain and promote the ideals and values of democratic society. Now, what give me reasons for hope? In the rule of law crisis, we did see convergence between European, between the two European courts offering more robust protection for human rights. This convergence very often meant that the Luxembourg court took the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg court and built several steps further. Uh, so a dialogue on the way back would, would, suggest, uh, would suggest that there is reasons for hope. We also do see that there is more broadly a dialogue between European constitutional actors and European human rights advocates are also picking up the language of non-retrogression. As a good example of a European constitutional actor speaking the language of non-retrogression, uh, a recent, a, a recent uh, press release of the Commissioner for Human Rights comes to mind when she called on the Slovakian parliament to reject retrogressive measures on access to safe abortion, saying uh, that these measures uh, that saying that the principle of non-retrogression prohibits any measures that diminishing that diminish existing rights. So I would like to, to suggest that there are reasons for hope. There is plenty of, of, of work ahead. And I do hope that many of us in, in this meeting will be able to carry out our, our work. Uh, last but not least, with the assistance of the community and the convener of this community around the table. Thank you very much. Extremely interesting and uh, timely uh, event.